Hey yo! With plenty of Liza P tip videos already floating out there in the ether, I'm looking to continue my trend of making up for not being first by hopefully bringing you the best. I have spent countless hours and way more deaths than I care to admit to try and bring you the helpful tips, tricks, and insights that will help you cut through the Liza P. If you just want to skip straight to the good stuff, all of the timestamps are right there below, but I just want to take a quick sec before we dive in to say a huge thank you to everybody who has been so amazing with their support. Those of you who've been sharing on Facebook and Reddit and like the six of you that still use WhatsApp, it has been hugely beneficial and we are now closing in very rapidly on our thousand subscriber goal. So a huge thank you to everybody who has been helping spread the word, sharing love and making sure to leave that like and subscribe. So with that out of the way, let's get into it. Starting with the very beginning of the game, my first tip is something super important that you want to keep in mind when making your starting build. Counterintuitive as it might seem, you actually don't want to overinvest in pumping your vitality. Compared to other games like Dark Souls and Elden Ring, Lies of P is definitely not forgiving with its reaction times, and the biggest enemies in the game can often end your run in just one or two hits. But Deej, I thought you just said! I know. It's the start of the video. Give me just 10 damn seconds. While you might want to compensate for big boss damage by packing on the hit points, the later game will see the damage of your enemies drastically outpacing your ability to simply absorb those hits. In reality, Liza P rewards players with memorizing patterns, reacting to enemy tells, and truly understanding the phases of a fight rather than grinding until you're over leveled for it. With that said, I would simply recommend prioritizing damage early on as long as you have enough health to deal with the normal enemies between boss fights. With beating bosses largely dependent upon perfect execution rather than winning a back and forth slugfest, adding to your output instead of your defenses simply lowers the number of times you have to respond perfectly. When it comes to how you deal this damage, I would also recommend you focus on leaning into technique over motivity. While I'm of the mind that you can beat this game using literally any build, one of the key things I would point you towards goes back to my first tip. In addition to late game bosses dealing way more damage than other Souls-like games on average, much of this damage comes in the way of awkwardly timed attacks, short reaction windows, and explosive combinations that make them very difficult to defend against or avoid. That said, while a strength build does, on average, deal more damage than builds that are made around dexterity, the dex-based weapons in this game have a huge edge when it comes to speed. With no poise or hyper armor system in place like comparable FromSoft titles, this means that many of your big damage attacks with strength weapons simply never make contact because they're too slow to actually land on big powerful enemies. Again, I believe with absolutely every fiber of my being that there is someone who can beat this whole game hitless at level 1 using only a toothpick or whatever. But for the average gamer or even a Souls-like fan like me that's played many of these games, I can promise you that you will find a lot more windows of opportunity relying on speed over power. As a result, I would strongly recommend trying to lean into technique early on even if you intend to change it up later. Fortunately, you can never really make a wrong choice when it comes to builds as you can always break everything down, throw your build away, and start over with respecking. I'm only including this here as a tip because I actually didn't know that this was in the game until my second playthrough. And if you find that you're struggling on a specific boss or not really enjoying the way that combat is feeling for you, simply starting fresh with a new approach can make an absolute world of difference. You can unlock respecking in the Grand Exhibition following the defeat of Champion Victor and collecting the Saint Mercy key. From there, you use the key to open up the Saint Mercy door, interact with the statue, and completely rework your stats, P organ upgrades, or calibers you've invested in your Legion Arms. You can also utilize the these same reworks at the gold coin fruit tree in Hotel Krat once you've unlocked respecking as an option. As a follow-up tip to respecking your character, I'd also want to mention a quick consideration about your capacity. Items, weapons, and armor weight in this game are extremely stringent when compared to other entries in the same genre, and managing your weight can be a huge hassle when trying to change amulets or converters for specific locations. That said, if you're looking to respec your character, I'd recommend you load your character up with all of the best items you have available and then allocate your available levels into capacity until you are below slightly heavy. That way, you know no matter how much you mix and match from then on, you're not going to run into the extra stamina drain of fighting while in combat, and capacity is also the stat used to provide you additional legion arm. So, you'll not only have the most protection available for yourself at all times, but you'll also have additional legion arm to draw on, all without slowing you down or causing you to die because you didn't have enough stamina left for that final dodge. If you're not convinced that managing your capacity in this way is important, another tip I would point you towards that many don't seem to know is that fall damage is actually impacted by your weight tier. While jumping or falling from high locations at 60% or less capacity will apply standard damage, this damage can be further reduced by dropping your weight tier down into the lightweight category 
category for the least fall damage possible. This can then be combined with the cat amulet to make fall damage almost a non-issue, so it might be something you want to account for when you're in an area where falling is a greater risk, or there are a few enemies nearby looking to knock you off a ledge. As an additional point on this before moving on, it should be noted that slightly heavy and beyond also has an inverse effect. So you can also drastically increase your fall damage too if you're not keeping an eye on your percentages. So <clears throat> keep that roll medium at least. So now that you won't fall off a ledge and die constantly, and we have your damage focused instead of your health, which you're not going to be losing to fall damage anyway, let's get on to beating bosses without really much issue at all. Now, the first and perhaps most important tip I can give you when it comes to combat is actually using your throwable items. Of all the weapons, legion arms, and potent protections you can get in Lies of P, absolutely none of them compared to the incredible effectiveness of throwing items. Firstly, throwable items have a range that is literally equal to your ability to lock on to an enemy. While this range can differ depending on a few different circumstances, this still equates to an incredible amount of distance that you can have between you and the target. Second, they're just extremely potent when it comes to damage. And third, they have the ability to apply damage over time effects to enemies, which in a game where you're spending a ton of time running, dodging, blocking, dying, and your enemy is healing while you're doing that, this additional tick damage becomes extremely helpful in giving you an edge in the fight. The only real downside to throwable items is how rare they are to pick up in the open world and how hard they are to accumulate through vendors. With throwables not super easy to come by, especially in the early game, I would recommend trying to minimize your use of these items to bosses exclusively unless you are sitting on an abundance. And how might you come to have an abundance of these massively overpowered items? Well, make sure that you don't miss the black market vendor available via the Malum District Stargazer. This vendor normally requires a bribe in order to be able to buy goods from him, but you can circumvent this too by picking up the smiling bunny mark from the grave located near the path of the Pilgrim Stargazer. Once you have him open for business, you'll find that this vendor stands in stark contrast to all of the other vendors you've met up to that point, as he will sell you an infinite amount of throwable items that you can use to constantly replenish your inventory. This not only means that you have a quick and safe way to replace the items you use during fights, but you can also spam these items now to overcome any bosses that you're having a particularly difficult time with. The one catch here, of course, is that purchasing a large amount of these throwable items is actually extremely expensive. Fortunately for you, you clicked on this video, so ergo is no hurdle. As it happens, there are a few farming locations throughout the game that will net you a pretty considerable sum of ergo in a very short period of time. The first one I would point you towards is actually right next to this Malum District vendor by clearing out the tavern within. Taking out the one large and several small enemies in an efficient circle and running back to the Stargazer will net you about a thousand ergo a minute, as long as you can keep the loop tight and efficient. There is also a pair of decayed angels that you can find in the Lorenzini Arcade that will give you an opportunity to double that up to 2k ergo per minute. However, I would caution you that if you're not particularly confident with your build and you don't have an exact science down for how you're going to stagger your enemies, this one definitely has a little bit of risk. And my personal favorite is actually at the Swamp Entrance Stargazer. Simply running to the end of the first walkway sees you fighting one of these furnace robots with a extremely easy and consistent stagger and a very short run back to the Stargazer. This one is going to net you about 1500 ergo per minute as well. And this is actually my preferred and favorite based on the safety and ease of getting this one down. Now, there are a lot of videos out there with suggestions on farming that'll give you a full walkthrough on how to do any number of them, so I will leave that to those people, but make sure that you're taking time to farm up some extra ergo and doing so in the most efficient way possible if you are short on supplies. In addition to the ergo you will net, a lot of these enemies due to their size and difficulty are also likely to drop items, additional ergo chunks and fragments, or special rare drops that you can use to upgrade your weapon. So never hesitate to take a quick time out from the story to make sure that you are ready for the next fight ahead. Now that you don't have any issues collecting huge amounts of ergo, you can pretty much buy whatever you want. But which item should you buy? Well, the first item I'd recommend is the Cluster Bomb. While the damage for it isn't super overwhelming, the biggest advantage it provides is that it deals multiple ticking hits on larger enemies that pose the most risk. While you most likely won't be taking them down using throwables alone, the Cluster Bomb provides the benefit of activating their stagger window quickly, which allows you to rush in for a power attack to unleash a fatal follow-up. On top of that, Cluster Bombs also 
also cause a minor stagger on most humanoid enemies and deals its damage in a small area, which makes it ideal for boss fights like Black Rabbit Brotherhood where you're dealing with multiple humanoids at once. Whether you're using it to deal quick damage to a group or as a way to deal continuous poise damage to keep your stagger window open, cluster bombs have a lot of versatility when used correctly, so make sure you are loaded up. Whether you're using cluster bombs or just banging away on enemies the old fashioned way, the next item I for sure want to point you towards is the shot put. While their damage is pretty mid overall, their benefits actually have nothing to do with dealing damage to the enemy. As it turns out, throwing a shot put at an enemy when their guard is broken will immediately cause them to stagger, allowing you to follow up with a quick fatal attack. When this is combined with enemies that move super quick, have small punish windows, or in instances where you simply don't want to add risk if you're low on health or can't get into position, these shot puts will quickly throw an enemy into full stagger without giving you the added risk or complication. Unlike cluster bombs, shot puts probably just don't have as much functional use outside of boss fights or big non-respawning enemies, but being able to stun an enemy from a mile away has a huge benefit that cannot be overstated. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is the canisters. While it seems like the general consensus on these items is that they don't really provide any great uses, I would say that there are two specific locations where they provide an incredible benefit. The first is right before you unleash a devastating fatal attack on your staggered opponent. Before you actually go in to deal that additional damage, you can quick drop a canister on your enemy to deal that additional tick damage over time right before you deal massive damage with your fatal attack. On larger enemies that aren't pushed back from your fatal, that means they're also soaking up extra damage during their animation to stand up, which is usually pretty long for larger enemies. The other window of opportunity is going to be directly after a fatal attack, where you throw enemy halfway across a room because your fatal attack pushes them up against a wall, and then you can rush in, immediately cornering them, and have that damage tick while you're standing there in defense. Regardless of how or when you make use of this extra damage, I just want to make sure that you're not overlooking the benefit of these items simply because they lack the range or flash of a lot of other items that people seem to be drawn to. And the last item I want to draw your attention to is the cogwheel. The game's tutorial menu seems to indicate that these are ways to deal additional damage from a distance, which is pretty not great, actually. But there are uses for these otherwise mundane items that are actually pretty beneficial. One of the best things you can do with these is lure out small enemies from enclosed areas where groups or ambushes pose the biggest threat. Even if you're still on your first playthrough and don't know where these ambushes might be, when you see multiple enemies group up, you likely already have a suspicion that there's probably more lurking in the shadows or maybe even a big bad looking to jump out and surprise you. Even if you're not suspecting a huge mob, your lantern alerting you to the presence of a nearby butterfly might give you reason to pull the enemies out ahead of time so you can give yourself the best chance at chasing down the butterfly once it spawns in. In addition to maneuvering your enemies into idealized locations, this otherwise garbage pickup is actually massively beneficial for eliminating traps from the safety of range without the risk of triggering them accidentally. Instead of maneuvering around these in combat, use this relatively small and garbage item to trigger them in advance or even use them to activate damage on your enemy. While the benefits might be relatively small when compared to some of the other items, I'd also argue that their price is considerably smaller than those other items. So make sure you at least have some of these on you for those windows of time where you might need them the most. They definitely make a difference. Now, with all of these tips so far, you're likely in really good shape to take on any powerful foe, which might make this next tip feel a little counterintuitive. Unusual as it might sound, my best tip for beating difficult bosses is actually planning to die. Unless you're a speedrunner that's mastered the minutia of boss stagger windows, or you're on your 10th playthrough where you know every attack that's coming and what to expect, you're probably going to struggle against the most powerful enemies in what has largely been described as one of the harder Souls likes in recent years. With that being the case, I think one of the best tips I can provide to newer players, or even players that are on their second playthrough, is planning to die to bosses is the best way to conserve your resources, familiarize yourself with the boss's attacks, and ensure that you're at least vaguely confident you have the boss figured out before you dump a bunch of resources into it. While you can certainly take risks here and there to play the game the way you enjoy most, I ended up stuck on a late game boss for quite a while on my first playthrough because I blew all of my powerful resources on my initial attempts and simply didn't have anything of value left once I finally had the fight figured out. So if you're new to the game, but also as a general rule for everyone, planning to die to bosses will likely save you from a big headache at some point. If you make an attempt just to get familiar and it's going extremely well, feel free to dump those resources in and see if you can finish it out. Otherwise, you're likely going to be much better off expending those resources once you know what to expect from the fight. So hang on to them until you feel
until you're ready or if the epic moment arises. But assuming you've done just that and you ultimately emerge victorious from whatever foe you have standing in front of you, I'd also suggest you make sure not to spend their valuable ergo until you've unlocked the special vendor in Act 4. While you can get a big boost of ergo early on from cashing these out, they're probably a much larger benefit from being exchanged for the special weapons and amulets once you come across Alidoro. None of these items are really required to advance through the game in a conventional sense, but they do provide powerful items that can give you a significant boost, many of which you might need in New Game Plus. Beyond that, each boss ergo can only be used once, and with two different selectable options for each boss, you'll need to conserve these precious resources for your first full playthrough as well as your first New Game Plus playthrough if you want to have access to everything. Again, these aren't required, but if you're looking for the full experience, you benefit significantly from hanging on to these at least long enough to get the various boss weapons and amulets that can drastically change the feel of a given playthrough. Now that we've covered most of what you need to know in order to have the best shot at defeating the game's toughest enemies, it's probably worth pointing out that you are just as much at risk of dying to swarms of lesser enemies in Krat as well. Whether it's a dense horde of smaller foes, the surprising appearance of one of the most fair enemies in the entire game, or one of the tougher open world bosses that pose a rather significant challenge in their own right, odds are good that you'll also rest in puppetry out in that open world between boss fights. When you do so, most folks are plenty accustomed to simply running back and collecting the ergo they've dropped, but did you know that there is a hidden mechanic where you can actually lose your ergo on the way back to collecting it? As a measure to discourage players from simply running back and collecting their resources, each enemy that hits you will deplete an amount of ergo that you're able to recover. While that's super annoying if you're trying to recover your ergo from a rather dangerous area, it's also worth mentioning that any reduction to your ergo recovery can also be counteracted if you kill the enemy that caused it. So while running back to pick up your ergo is oftentimes the easiest and most efficient choice, you may want to focus on accuracy over speed during your run back depending on how thick the enemies are. While you're doing this run back, most Souls-like fans already know the tried and true formula of sprinting past every enemy in front of you in a desperate dash to recover your lost resources. Fortunately for you, another quick tip to keep in mind while you're doing this run back is that you can actually stop enemies from pursuing you entirely by using certain triggers or breakpoints that de-aggro your enemies as well. Notable among these options are moving up or down a ladder, speaking with merchants, or approaching the entrance to a boss fight. In all of these instances, you can actually avoid having a swarm of enemies chasing after you as if you had quit out and reset the position and the aggro of all nearby enemies. On that note, quitting out to reset enemy aggro can also have some strange effects that you may want to play with in some circumstances. Something to keep an eye out for. Now up to this point we focused on getting you ready for combat, but I haven't really provided a lot of insights into combat itself. So starting with all of the fundamental pieces, if you're a veteran of FromSoft's benchmark titles, you're likely familiar with the three core defensive options being dodge, block, and parry. However, unlike many of FromSoft's comparable alternatives, dodging functions a little bit different than many players might be used to. In Lies of P, dodging is less reliable and provides less movement than other Souls-like titles and may end up throwing you off a bit. Not only is dodging slightly less effective as a general strategy, but it also consumes a great deal more stamina, which also tends to recharge much slower than how many players may expect. Now, with that said, dodging obviously can work and is a viable option in combat, but being completely unable to dodge fury attacks and the tight timing window you need to hit to avoid damage, you'll find that dodging is often maybe the least effective choice when applying all your defenses in combat. That said, there are of course some bosses where dodging is actually the more efficient option to dodge quick hitting double attacks or when you use it to get out of range, but your best bet when using the dodge mechanic is either dodging through enemy attacks so you can maintain close distance or combining it with a circular strafe that keeps you casually out of reach when your enemy attacks. With dodging likely proving difficult and dangerous in many situations, trying to block attacks is ultimately the ideal approach. When you successfully block an attack in Lies of P, you don't actually take damage from the attack immediately, but instead you lose a portion of the attack's damage over time as indicated by a coloration of your health bar. If you're able to quickly deal damage while this recoverable health is still there, you'll actually regain any missing health that has been depleted. This recoverable health can actually be increased and regained more effectively depending 
depending on the selections of your P organ upgrades, but still isn't the ideal if an enemy dies before you recover that missing health or it's too dangerous to be aggressive and follow up. Even if you can recover that missing health, it's still important to point out that you can't block glowing red fury attacks, many of which come out super quickly or take up a ton of physical space. Blocking also has the added drawback of draining your stamina, which means it's nearly impossible to block straight through an incredibly long or powerful combo and will just result in you dying later. Now that you've mastered the art of being able to die tired, that brings us to parrying. While it is fair to say that parrying is easily the hardest option of the three, I'd also go so far as to say it is probably the most important skill you can learn in the game. Not only can parries actually block fury attacks, but they can also function as attacks on their own based on P organ upgrades, the weapon that you're using, or which legion arm you have equipped. In addition to providing better defense overall, parries also deal stagger damage to an enemy, which means it's entirely possible to activate an enemy's stagger window before you've actually made any attacks. Now, that's probably not advisable, but like, you can do it. While these are three obvious and clear benefits, there is still one other bonus that makes parries the clear choice in combat over dodging and blocking. Even though mastering the art of the parry is definitely a difficult task, if you manage a successful series of parries against an enemy wielding a weapon, you can actually break their weapon entirely. While there is an extremely visceral satisfaction in literally destroying an enemy's weapon, it also serves to completely mitigate much of the threat that most enemies pose. For starters, breaking an enemy weapon it in half well does just that it breaks it in half with only half the range on their attacks all of a sudden dodging and strafing out of the way becomes a much more viable option since they can't punish you as effectively for being in a bad position second it also provides you a substantial reduction to their overall damage output that makes enemies much less dangerous now because of how much damage enemies deal in this game you probably still don't want to stand there and trade blows with them regardless but now you can be at least a little bit more cavalier with your attacks as broken weapons also don't don't stagger you out of your power attacks once they're in motion. I know that mastering parries is certainly an intimidating hurdle for many players to clear, but if I hadn't already made a compelling case for why focusing on parries is important, then hopefully this seals the deal for you. But there's obviously one big component to parries that we haven't covered, and they're, well, just really, really hard to do sometimes. While it's true parries do require extremely quick reactions combined with memorizing an enemy's moveset, there are actually quite a few ways to make this much easier on yourself. One of the easiest things you can do to increase your consistency is using the Aegis Shield Legion Arm. While the arm itself is extremely heavy and will interfere with your capacity, this extra weight is offset by providing a large shield that offers massive damage reduction, a persistent defensive option you can literally hold in front of you, and most importantly, a very forgiving window after it's deployed to perform that perfect parry. You can increase this effectiveness further with upgrades that add a burst of damage anytime you do a successful parry, which means you're not only preventing 100% of the damage coming through, but you're also immediately turning it around and dealing additional damage to the attacking enemy. Not only will this deal damage, but it's also going to aid you in building their stagger meter and in some cases, simply finishing an enemy outright. If the timing of parries is what's preventing you from trying to dive into them headlong, I would definitely recommend picking picking up the Aegis Shield to see if that makes a difference for you. If a quick deployable shield isn't really your style or the build you're running doesn't allow you to tack on that much weight, another thing to consider is that there are a number of fable arts that allow you to increase your odds of parrying or dealing drastically increased stagger damage when you succeed. These two can be a little tricky to time, but the amount of stagger damage that they do is significant enough where it's worth your time to develop a familiarity with the weapon arts on all of your weapons to not only see what benefits they provide on offense, but on defense as well. The Fable Arts are just cool as hell to land in game and I'd recommend making sure you're leaning on all of your available tools to make sure that you're making the game easier for yourself. As an aside on Fable Arts, they can be somewhat difficult to generate quickly if you're just roaming around in the world, so do keep in mind that if you happen to make a quick stop over at Hotel Krat, you can automatically regain all of your Fable Arts immediately just by stepping out into the training area. So it's a little time consuming to do on a regular basis, but it's definitely worth your time to quick pop out and 
top up if you're heading into a boss fight or you know that you're going to be facing some tough open world enemies. If you do swing back to Hotel Krat to fill up on Fable charges and you're not in a particular hurry, I'd also recommend making sure that your weapon is optimized for combat by adding a crank to your weapon to maximize its overall effectiveness. Each handle has a base value for motivity, technique, and advance, or strength, dexterity, magic if you prefer, and you can maximize a weapon stat bonus by ensuring that it has a crank modification that complements the stats you've chosen to lean into. Especially when you get into later game, if you're using a weapon that you're enjoying and having fun with but it's not designed for your build, you can get a massive boost of damage simply by tuning it at least a little bit more towards the stats that you've already specced into. Beyond that, if you're enjoying the move set of a given weapon or want to apply that parry fable art I mentioned to a different weapon, make sure that the attack type of the handle also matches the corresponding attack type of the blade that you are affixing it to. It's likely super easy to miss unless you're looking for it, but some handles can have huge damage reductions for certain blades because the moveset simply doesn't complement the intended design of the weapon. So in the same way that a hammer and axe heads aren't meant to be used as thrusting weapons, the piercing tip of a spear or rapier isn't intended to be a slashing weapon either. So, make sure you're paying special attention to these boons and debuffs when you're changing out handles on weapons. Regardless of what combination you go with, the best approach to victory is often going to be a combination of the tips that we've already discussed, but another thing to keep in mind is that keeping your weapon sharp and combat ready will keep you out of trouble. As you block and attack, your weapon will eventually grow dull and become less effective over time. If you let it go too dull, you'll actually have your standard attack start bouncing off of enemies after every attack, which will completely eliminate your ability to attack multiple times in a row, and with some weapons, will even prevent you from staggering your opponent once that stagger window is open. If you still don't sharpen your weapon at that point, one, what are you even doing with your life? And two, your weapon will eventually break completely and you won't be able to use it at all until you rest at a stargazer. Once you've gotten to this point, no amount of sharpening it at a grinder will make it usable again, so make sure that you're keeping an eye on it and having it on your third belt for quick access when it's needed. If you're following these tips, you should be progressing fine out in the open world, but I have a few additional combat tips that we can work in here with a little less detail. When fighting standard sized human enemies, one of the quickest and most effective ways to get rid of them is by circle strafing around their attacks and then immediately following up with a backstab critical during their recovery animation. While performing this backstab animation, you're also completely immune to additional attacks and if there are any enemies nearby when you finish it, the critical strike will actually cause them to minor stagger once you complete it. With slower or less coordinated enemies, you can even execute this strategy multiple times in a row to keep yourself free from danger and easily get rid of multiple enemies quickly. Pulling this off in sequence likely will only work against puppets, however, you can also potentially pull this off during the Black Rabbit Brotherhood fight where there are multiple human enemies nearby as well. If you're facing a big enemy that can't be backstabbed, or you simply find yourself down to your last pulse cell quicker than expected, another unintuitive tip you might not have considered is using your last pulse cell earlier than you need to. While your instinct might be to wait until you can get maximum value out of it by taking a little bit more damage, you can actually earn new pulse cells as soon as you spend your last one. That means that you're building towards a free extra pulse cell with a full health bar rather than at least a little bit of it missing when you might find yourself in a jam. Admittedly, it's a very subtle difference between the two, but at the end of the fight, you're not really looking to maximize how many pulse cells you have left over, you're just looking to maximize how much health you have left once the boss is dead. Popping that last pulse cell early may only add a little bit more than attempting to maximize it, but with as many one-shot attacks as there are in this game, being topped off as much as possible possible, especially with your last pulse charge is always a good idea. Now, thus far, I've given you hopefully everything you'll need to have zero concerns in taking on combat with confidence, but even if you are plenty capable, sometimes using threats against you to actually damage your opponents is infinitely more satisfying. I'd recommend you also make sure that you are using the various traps found throughout the world to take out your enemies to avoid taking that damage yourself. Pressure plate traps, trip wires, and bear traps will all deal damage to any enemy that walks through them, so if you happen to spot one before triggering it yourself, save yourself the effort, the weapon degradation, and the risk by using them against your foes. Admittedly, this tip really only benefits you in a few specific areas, but using it could prevent you from burning that last pulse charge that may end up dragging you through to the next stargazer.
And in keeping with the theme of doing less work but for more benefit, you can actually have different groups of enemies fight each other as well. Multiple acts have otherwise difficult sections that can be made much easier by allowing puppets and carcasses to fight one another while you just sit back, collect the ergo, and mop up whoever is left alive. This is another tip that likely won't come up super often, but it does seem to lend itself to particularly dangerous sections or powerful enemies. So make sure that you're letting those threats do the work for you when the opportunity opportunity presents itself instead of trying to dive in and kill all the enemies yourself. With combat largely covered and a bunch of advantages you can now give yourself, let's quick talk about the story. Unlike the typical FromSoft game, the story and quests in Liza P kind of actually make sense to the average person. That said, they also try to encourage you to seek out some of the hidden experiences in the game by leaving these quest icons near any stargazers that you've previously activated to let you know that the next step or the resolution of a quest can be found within that zone. Some of these icons might make this tip a little bit more apparent than others, but in general they're easy to overlook or bypass if you're not already aware that they're there or what they're trying to indicate. Beyond that, if you advance the story too much, some of these quests can resolve themselves, so if you see them, make sure to wrap up these quests as they can have automatically negative reactions if you don't follow up while advancing on that story. And the last tip I want to leave you with while you're engaging in this exploration is regarding the magical butterflies you'll come across in the open world. While the value and rarity of these items can vary and doesn't seem to be tied exclusively to color, their behavior is significantly different from one another and they all pose unique challenges. Red butterflies will simply fly in whatever direction is approximately away from you. Purple butterflies will move slow and erratically, but will also phase shift to nearby locations given enough time. And gold butterflies will move plenty slow and predictably, but will emit periodic AOE bursts designed to push you out of the way, into danger, or simply increase the difficulty of you killing them in time. Regardless of the butterfly's color, know that they will always respawn after you rest at a stargazer, so don't feel a need to overextend yourself or take big risks to get them. You can always go back when you have more health or resources, or if you found yourself in a tough spot when you came across them for the first time. And with that, you have all the best tools, tips, and insights that I could give you to keep from getting strung up in crot. Please make sure that you are sharing with those who might be interested or could benefit from this information. And if you found this video helpful, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe to help us close in on that goal. And until I see you next time, party on.